this is destroyed nonchalance. Taking culture apart one episode at a time. A social commentary podcast on pop culture, fashion, film, and music. Hello, hey. welcome back to Destroyed Nonchalance. This week we're going to be talking about movies and shows that we've been seeing, like Shrill and Lighthouse. We just saw Military Wives. But then also we're going to talk about some of the relevant queer work we've been doing. We work a lot of the day, and then we barely get a chance to watch anything. <laughs> so there's been a lot of things that have gone by the wayside, actually. A yeah. lot of movies that, you know... It, we have we have the OD on Limitless, so we can go see any movie, but some movies and just And you would haven't... think that we would take advantage of that. Yeah, but, but I, mean... I mean, one big example of that, there there have been some, like, depressing-looking movies, and... Like what? I wasn't excited very much to go see The Lighthouse, oh, and yeah. it was just, you know, it was in the awards categories, and we went to see it, and it delivered what I thought it was, which was just some dread-filled... I, you know, I really like The Witch and I don't know if it was because of the subject matter or the actors playing it. And I mean, this and The Lighthouse basically has two actors in it and you got to really fucking love them or else you've got, you're in for a long fucking slog with it. And you better fucking love lighthouses or else you're in for a long fucking slog. (laughs) And. I mean, it Robert, was Robert long. Pattinson and William Defoe did a really good job. They're William amazing Defoe actors. Insane. The acting in this movie is crazy. And but... you think of like a two-person movie, a two-actor movie, and you're like, okay. And I wasn't ever bored. Like, no. um, what was the, the, the farmer fighting against the Nazi movie? Um, and halfway through that, I was like, this is boring. That was a Terrence Malick movie. I can't it was remember boring. the title right now, but I liked that movie, but it but was Lighthouse very long. But Lighthouse wasn't boring. No, but it, it but was it wasn't just scary, so... scary, like, like the I was witch. waiting for a delivery of something. Like, make a decision. Are you going to innuendo about these two guys, you know, either liking or not liking each other? There's a lot of sexual tension, and then there's a lot of, like, but those are mythical like, mermaids. So and... unsexy characters. And, you okay, you said that there's going to be a mermaid. What's and real? What's not? And then you have these two people and you're, and you're like, oh, there's like a sexual chemistry between these two actors. I mean, really, you don't care about the heavily, sexual chemistry between the two. They heavily dropped those things. Well, yeah, in they there. did. But it's really? almost like a prison kind of thing. But in my fantasy, the prisoners would be sexier. But they there's nobody else around. Things, you're going to get horny like, for the person that you're around. Are you talking around. about it? What's the mythical thing up in the light? What is that? What is about the myth about the sailor's souls being in those birds and him killing one? Is that what brought you the bad luck? I really liked that. That's, How, I really liked, I liked that one part about just, the seagull coming back. I mean, because that's like the one thing I could follow through in, uh, through the end. Well, and, yeah, the seagull coming back. And I would have liked if here's the string, here's the whole string. But they kind of like, once it's done, they, they cut it. And, and oh, do you think there's anything that other, we missed? About it, like if we went back to, and I'm, there's no way in hell I'm going to watch that no. a second time. But do you think? And I'm not usually like that. I, if I mean, if something is deep or complex or it gives my brutal. mind something to like think about, it was brutal. Then I would go back and watch it again. Like Blue Velvet is brutal, but yeah, there's but something about so... it that's watchable. But this was not <laughs> no. And it was anxiety filled, brutal, just like there is no. It didn't make me feel anxiety at and all. At the end, it's just no, no. I, so anyway. I, I didn't we, feel anything for that movie. I didn't even feel anxiety. I, all I kept thinking is I could have been doing something better and now I can't be doing something better. And I, I like now I'm falling behind in my responsibilities. And that put us off, I think, as I was saying, from going to some movies, even. Because I, I knew I had seen, you know, Like a Boss, the trailer. And I after that movie, I was just, I want to see something dumb. But and, you know what? It wasn't know. that. Okay, yeah, it was dumb. It's a dumb no, formula, but, but it's actually funny. It was it, it was, was really good, It was what funny. I needed. Okay, because we're sitting here in a cafe and we're like working for it's hours and hours. And like, I wanted comedy. I wanted something that it didn't have to be 
predictable. Um, it didn't have to not be predictable. But that's the. But, but that's it worked. The power of the movie trailer because the first time around we booked it and we didn't go because I, don't even I just thought that. I'm not excited. The trailer I had seen first, I was just like, why? And then I saw the trailer again. It was a different trailer, and it was the Who last day. Who has time to watch trailers? I don't have time to watch trailers. Well, yeah, but it just it was a different light, and then and it turned out funny. And exactly yeah. what it needed to be. It was- and I love Selma Hayek. You put Selma Hayek in anything, you can put her in a, in a, a serial commercial. And I'm going to watch and the I serial mean, Tiffany commercial. Hanish. <laughs> yeah, Tiffany Hanish. She was good. And Rose Byrne. I mean, just uh, all, well, I mean, she's in I both like movies. her, but you know what? I mean, she is a staple of that kind of movie. Selma Hayek, not so much. She doesn't do that very many. Rose Byrne wouldn't have a career if there weren't those kind of movies. No, she has other things. I just <sighs> can't remember them right now. Exactly. Stop. No, Could I like rude. Rose Byrne, but she's she was very in, much like, um, those scary movies. And she was also in that lawyer movie. Um, yeah, I can't with Glenn Close, titles. right? Yeah, yeah. Oh, that was good. The, it's it a was series. a TV show. Yeah, yeah. So I mean, I like her, anyways. So it, that was a nice little fresh thing. And then we saw Army Wives earlier. We saw today. that. T- and, okay, we know that there's a thousand of these. Choir movies out where like this group of people they get together for one reason or another. They always have to have a reason to start singing and they have a performance. And that's exactly what I was thinking for the the first 10 minutes of the movie. But after the first 10 minutes, it was just completely different. And this maybe because it's based on something real and because it talks about some really serious issues and you know, the reality of being a military wife. Uh, and I mean, it, it was a really human, human realities. And I don't think the movie was amazing, amazing. I no, think it, it was formulaic. Some of the songs were like, just like, oh, kill me now. It was formulaic in a way. But then again, it's based on a true story. But it's interesting to see the walls, the Kristen Scott Thomas character, those walls right. come down because her son essentially died. And yeah. You know, I, I mean, we've seen her walking around and she's the, very yeah. much how her character is. I mean, she seemed like the character at the beginning of the movie and like, she, and Kristen, Stop, uh, Kristen Scott Thomas, she wasn't walking around in jeans. She wasn't like no. hemming it up. She wasn't like dancing or anything. She had it pulled together. She was very, I mean, she was very much like her character was at the beginning of the movie. And. So, I mean, yeah, it, it was a good movie, and it, it was a good performance of that last song. I, th- that last it song, reached. I want to put it into our iTunes list. It, and, it like, was, was very sad. I want to put it into our iTunes so that we can hear it more often, because, I don't know, it has, like, some truth to it. Like, something that's worth remembering, don't you think? Yeah, I, it resonated. I liked the movie. I'm glad it wasn't just every run of the mill. Part of it was, but it got out of that. It really like made differentiated itself so there was I, some like real emotion I had a couple yeah. of points like starting midway through the movie and then towards the end yeah it's very emotional but it was it was worth going to the theater for i think yeah i liked it and then we've been watching shrill we started watching oh shrill. i really like shrill um i like the characters i like the setting i like the emotional tone of it um it's just, it's really working for it's me. It's good. I'm glad there's two seasons for us to watch. Yeah. Because I'm, I'm liking it. And we started What's watching... the actress's name? She's, there are a lot of Saturday Night SNL. Live, um, alumni in that, um, show. I, I'm like, the, the name is on the tip of my tongue, but I can't. Okay. Something ID. A- A.D. Bryant. A.D. Bryant. And we've seen three episodes of it. So far, yeah, and yeah. they've just been they they're just good. They're on the BBC player. They're very real, <laughs> like the very the way they talk about brutal. the issues and what she's going through. I mean, they present so many issues that everybody goes through. And it's so weird that I mean we've seen bits of some of this in other shows, but it's very they just haven't had very many characters like her. Well, what show are you, are you thinking about that other one? Um, the one um, where she's like the terrorist and she's going yeah. against the beauty industry. And that one's like so over the top. It doesn't no, feel as relatable. A little closer to home. 
yeah just real and and i like it and it's kind of talking about i think real things that happen to real people and they're in yeah i mean and- she has like body issues and the way people treat her because of her her size but other than that i mean they, they talk about shitty relationships and i mean and things that you would know like like even the, the learning after pill not working on overweight yeah and we all know like mothers and daughters who have whose mother like undermines the the esteem of the daughter and everybody has that mom (laughs) well i don't have that mom something yeah well you're not dealing with weight issues like some other people have yeah no i don't think they're all related to weight issues either I mean, everybody's had a shitty boyfriend. And, I mean... no. Well, there's a special level of shitty for this one. (laughs) I want him to go the fuck away. Just be done with this fucking loser. I don't want to see him anymore. So, come on. I mean, because she's a struggling writer. And she finally gets her first article published. And And she's having a work party. Is in this. Oh, yeah. Fucking Hedwig. I love... Yeah, it's nice to see him in a show that we actually want to watch. And not in Girls. I mean, he was in Girls and we didn't watch oh, that. I didn't but even remember. Yeah. I mean, he almost plays the same kind of character in Girls as he does in this. Like a, like a boss type. kind of, a, like a sharp boss. But I like Cameron Mitchell. I like Yeah, I'm excited to see some more episodes and see where it goes. Cause but this is so much, so much more watchable than Girls. Yeah, it's... So much better. I think we stopped watching it when Cameron Mitchell, around the same time, joined the cast. Yeah, we have like two or three seasons where we didn't. We saw him at London Pride. I have a picture of Cameron Mitchell. Yeah. And and I mean, he was, I think he was like on his phone. He was kind of off by himself. But Yeah, we're big fans of him. Yeah, short bus. the, The last show that we watched was I'm Not Okay With This. Yeah. Which was a... We kind of like. There was a nothing burger, it. kind of. No, I liked it. I liked it. I but... liked it. It was very short, like 20 minute show on Netflix. Yeah, I mean. If you... And then the main characters are good, and it's kind of like. They're building but what happens, something. Yeah, when you have to go through the whole season and they almost built to something, I mean, what they built to is almost like a reenactment of a scene from Carrie. Except, like, the dynamic is reversed, where she gets her revenge on somebody to everyone's horror, rather than the, the her receiving... Like, yeah, but it's like, it's like a movie, just broken up. Because if you put all those 20 minutes together, there's like six or seven episodes. Yeah. It's like a movie. Yeah, but... And maybe, maybe because it is broken up like that into 20 minute episodes, it felt very unsatisfying by the end. Cause you I would, want more. I would not I stop watching it. More. But I felt, I felt like not enough happened. Not really, a, uh, not, not enough happened. She blew up a guy's head. Yeah. yeah some I mean, stuff happens. this is 2020. That happens in the first five minutes. No, in a lot I know, of but a, a lot of the show, you're like, is it just in her head? I never What's really thought on? that. Well, I did until it was clarified that it wasn't. And. But if it's done well, it's supposed to stay ambiguous like that, right? Yeah, I just didn't know where the show was going. Was it just a manifestation of a girl's feelings, or what's it going to go? I think it totally okay. can work on that level. So it's it'll be interesting to see who this person, if they renew it, what happens there. But I mean, those... but when you think about it, because isn't it from like Stranger Things? And think about everything that happens in Stranger Things. And then you have the characters, like the cast from... It, they can't have all have that budget. <laughs> well, no, Stranger yeah, Things is crazy, and they got lots of budget. But even in the first season, when no one knew what Stranger Things was, so much happened, and now you well, have this spoiled, main actress just from like it. everybody else. Well, Stranger Things is longer than twenty minutes, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, it's an hour. So each episode, and I did get triggered a little bit not with this show, but just going back to Shro for a second. Because they were doing like the the boyfriend and the geek friends are talking about this podcast Alcatraz thing that they're and it's just like oh no is that what we're doing <laughs> I don't want to do that <laughs> they were just like getting into like nitpicky details of like all of this podcast crap and I'm just uh I don't know I don't want to be another podcast or whatever 
I don't, I mean... It was I, trigger, trigger. I, I Well, that, what you're saying makes me think of the it military wives and every good band is just a crappy band that stuck with it long enough to not be crappy anymore. Yeah. So, I mean, that's my goal for the podcast. It's a crappy podcast until we put in enough work for it not to be crappy anymore. So, yeah, no, that's fine. I mean, I don't think it's crappy and I don't think it's anything like that one that they were talking about like what the fuck are you gonna do with like alcatraz and that's all well they had hipsterness to like a fucking science yeah, and that the hipster like uh, what was the the gross. pencil break challenge <laughs> just gross no <laughs> triggered i do not want to be anywhere near that world that's so this is real this is why you want ass. her to leave this loser boyfriend uh, um, gross, gross, yeah gross, because gross. he misses out on her office party because he's at home <laughs> in his house is packed full of people watching him have a pencil break challenge with a girl he's fucking and that's on the what side they're doing Pencil. He's fucking her on the side, okay? <laughs> They're breaking pencils. No. No, 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 no. So, no, no, no. And that's it. No. We did go see Jamie for Bianca Del for Rio's last, time. last night. Um, I might drop in some audio because Bianca uh, at the stage door just doing her autographs. That's uh, a show. And, oh my God, she's so hilarious. At least it's pretty the tricks. Tristy's face is foul. <laughs> Whatever her name is. It was a season after me. What do I care? I'm going to be on the show next. This is Jean. Oh, yeah. yeah. We'll work it out. We'll add you in. Like, let her, we can throw you in. Good to see you. You can open up for my tour. I'm always, I'm, I can't bring Sherry. Sherry's already dead inside. We'll make it happen. Good to see you. Thank you so much. Good to see you. And I'll be back soon. I'm on now. I'm coming back again. Don't worry. Not to the show right now, but no. No, no, of course. No, I gotta get through this here. Hi, my love. How are you? Nice to see you. I don't want to write a lovely jacket. Yes, sir. I do this to people. I don't even realize it. I scribble on the jacket and then fucking complain on Twitter. You did not bring me more shit. I'm gonna kill you. Do you know my bag it weighs some 500 pounds? Oh, that's fabulous. Is it light up? Oh, this is the gayest thing I have ever seen. This is the fucking fabulous thing. I'm sorry, this is pretty. Dealing with these, I mean, her energy level is so high going through. How many people were in that line behind there the stage so door? Many people. I mean, it was her last night, but I think every night she gets a tons of people at the stage. But door. how many people were there? Like two hundred? Yeah, people. Maybe. And she she was just like she was laughing, Next. she was signing, and she was posing for pictures, she was something. making everybody laugh, and yeah, I mean, we just stuck around to like just take it all in because she's such a performer and she just gives and gives. Because, I mean, Jamie is, like, a really good audience pleaser. Like, everyone comes out of it really just having had a good time. Let's talk a bit about what we've been doing so much of the work on. So, we've been working on Relevant Queer and um, IA stuff, of course, Image Amplified, and I've been working on the research and abstract. But let's start with just the past week. What have we been, who are the people that we've been writing about for Relevant Queer? Well, there's been, there's been a lot of, I mean, I'm so interested in all of the people that we talk about. So we had Pier Paolo Pasolini, which yeah. is an Italian director, very controversial. Yeah. And, what, and I've only heard of some of his movies, his films. I don't know if I've actually seen I've never seen, seen any. any of them. So what are some of his films? I, I I just know Sodom. Right. And The 120 Days of Sodom, which yeah. was supposed to be about um, the fascist, um, the, the Italian social republic, right? Socialist republic. And I think Stephen Klein references that movie a lot. The, because it looks very S and M, it's very much about like I don't know if a movie like control. that could get made right now. I mean, he did a lot of like kind of ab- abuse. You could potentially say to some of those actors, like it's unethical working conditions, or yeah. like the subject yeah, matter that. is not it's just going to get. It's not going to get. No, I think it. the unethical. Yeah, I mean things I, about it, and I mean it was banned in almost everywhere. 
Yeah. So if we want to see it, we'd have to dig it up. But I mean, but, uh, I mean, okay, even if it was completely faked and it was like a, a fine working environment, I think the subject matter alone, n- who's going to make that kind of movie now? I mean, that's going to get any kind of like widespread release or recognition. No, and it was supposed to be like a part of a trilogy. Oh, did the other two parts no. get made? No. No, he, oh. he didn't get to make them. So he, this director came up from nothing. And I mean, he was queer and he was very open about it. And, you know, you can see he had like a 15 year old boyfriend, didn't he? Yeah, he he became his muse and he called him the love of his life and put him in some of his movies. I think he played Christ in one of them. Really? Yeah. So it it is. They and they had a relationship that lasted for a number of years. Yeah. His name is Ninetto Davoli. And right. he, he became an actor in his own right. Like, he's still out there. He's alive. Oh, he is. Yeah. And, and he, he has a long filming career. Okay. Um, and he's always talked well of him and of how ambitious and how much he pushed the boundaries. And you can really see. I mean, he was sued over 30 times for his obscenity. The director. And not yeah, the actor. The, the director. Yeah. Um, yeah. 33 times, I think it was. And it was like obscenity. But it was also like religious charges, wasn't it? Like, well, yeah, because he, heresy. He was raised Catholic or Christian and, and he rebelled against it all and, and he used it and he, you know, made his films in a way that kind of like went above religion and he understood poverty and all of that in such a way that he can, I just this is just based on some of the research, so because we haven't seen any of the. So again, his name is Pier Paolo Pasolini. Pasolini, and he even won like I think it's because of his early film. He was looking at like the life of Christ as a martyr, and the Catholics gave him a film award. But I think he like probably regretted there was like a trajectory where his films just got more and more like dark and twisted and like the catholic church eventually denounced him and and, he got very political yeah he got really political and so all of all of that 120 days of sodom is really a political movie it's just dressed up as an snm like how governments can really like how you know nazi things Right, and how they can like thing. do things to your body, basically. So just how everything can get out of control. Right. So I think we should add that to our list. That movie, we should try to find it yes. and add it to our list because, I mean, I think one of the points of relevant queer is to become familiar with the contributions to culture that these people are making. And how are we supposed to be familiar with it if we're not watching any of it? And that's what I think, anyway. No, I'm, I agree, and I, I like it. I it doesn't mean we're going to endorse it, or it doesn't mean that it's going to become become one of our favorites. But I think we should at least watch it. Soon. And just to mention one quote of his before we go into the next one: "An artist, if he's unselfish and passionate, is always a, a living protest." It's very Madonna esque, yeah, isn't it's it? What she said. Kind yeah, of. it's the artist's job to disrupt the piece. Yeah, yeah. So that kind of reminded me of the Madame X and all of that. Yeah. So who was another person? There we had a Spanish poet. Um, I don't remember if it was this week. Emilio Prados was the Spanish poet, and he was really influential. It was called the Gen- the twenty seven, the Generation twenty seven. Yeah. And he knew Picasso and Salvador Dali and, um. Juan Ramon Jimenez. Right. Um, no, sorry, not him, but he's a big poet, but Federico Garcia Lorca, which is a musician, um, he was a big, uh, friend of, um, Salvador Dali. So there's a lot of photos of them together, but he was influential in, his poetry, and he was part of that Generación 27, which is generation of 1927, this this group of poets. So it wasn't a group of 27 poets. No, it was 1927, the Kind year. of like the, the class, okay. the, their class, essentially, that they went to 
residencia estudiantes. It's their school. Right. But, yeah, it was interesting to find out about him and how he became political with his poetry and essentially got exiled because the civil war that happened in Spain. Right. You know, their side lost and he had to go. Because his poems early on were all about him and his, his feelings and his sensuality and the love of his life. But then when you start having the Civil War come up, the Spanish Civil War and the Republic, he started becoming, le his work was less about him and more about the political going on, the goings on that were happening at the time. And that got him, well, he didn't just write about it. He published it. He, and then he had like a printing press. Yeah. He had a magazine and it was influential. Yeah. And <laughs> so there was a reason why he had to go. He and he became part of the government, like the Republican, like the Republic. He was their talking piece. Yeah. In a way. So when they Propaganda fell. Propaganda is that I don't really know the sides of the Civil War. Yeah. I mean, I mean, honestly, I really haven't either. And I've known it existed. I know like Guernica, like, and Picasso and, you know, a lot of artwork at the time became very political, but I don't know like what the inside issues were, like what it was about. I know yeah. a lot of the artistic response to it. So this, the, this poetry adds to that. And his poetry was, and I'm not a huge fan of poetry, but there's a lot of innuendos and, and he had to, really come up with his own way to write that didn't use she pronouns. That right. Wasn't he rejected like the heterosexual language, yeah. which was very well established and beautiful, ornate at that time. And he had to like get rid of it. He just rejected it and had to come up with his own language and his own words and symbols. And if you read some of his poems, they're so, if you really like read into them, they're so kind of passionate and sexual in they're some very ways. Su suggestive really suggestive like what <laughs> what did i just read like you kind of blush a little bit <laughs> yeah i mean it's it's a rougher language because he because he's constructing it all on his own and yeah so i mean it's really he interesting was, he was really interesting and i and i liked some of the photos that I found. I wonder if there are any like audio recordings of his poetry being read. I don't know that that many poems of his have officially by academics been translated into English. Oh, uh, okay. Because it's, there is one book of his poems in English. Uh, but I don't think that some of his work has really been out there as much as, you know, you would hope. Some of the writers that we've done, they're really obscure. We've done South American writers, people from Cuba, and right. their work never really gets that big, even though they're talking about well, really the Cuban, important queer things. The Cuban population, they don't have access to it, but it, even though it's been published internationally within that country, like yeah, they no, just don't have they, access. They, they, there's no access to it, and it's just it's a shame. That some of these people, I never knew about any of these people. Right. Um, the, the, uh, the lady that we talked about. Wait, do you have a quote from? Yes. I, and I what's do. his name again? It's Emilio Prados. Prados. And I liked, I liked this quote. My hand is beautiful. My tongue is beautiful. My skin is beautiful. And my sin is beautiful. Ah, I, I mean, like that. isn't that just, Really nice. Yeah. It's, yeah. It's so, very warming. It's very, it's energizing. Yeah, because these, these people come to accept themselves. Right. And you, you do, if you go to the Instagram, it is a little bit edited down. Go to the Image Amplified website because I, yeah, it's a fuller Instagram limits. So there are things that I, I do have to cut out, especially I hate I can it. go a bit long. No, but it's important things. Yeah. And so I, I hate, I sometimes I spent over an hour just thinking, how, how can I cut this or what, what's really important? And it's a, it's a challenge once I get your writing. Yeah. So, I mean, it's a challenge, but you know, so far, <laughs> so far, so good. <laughs> and, um, 
Let's just cover two more. Okay. Um, cause we do, we do one every day. Last week, we did four because we skipped Michelangelo. <laughs> yeah. Uh, <laughs> cause he's just so big. And honestly, it was like such a long day. And... It had been a very long day, but I, I found out so much about him that it'll yeah. be interesting to come back to him. Yeah. Um, maybe I'll just drop it into the calendar. That way we have it. Yeah. Available. So the, the lady that we did was, uh, and I don't know how to... Mad- Mademoiselle Rockcourt. Uh, her full name is Francois-Marie Antoinette Sacre-Court. It's very bad. I Marie don't know Antoinette was... Uh, um, she was... She gave money to this actress. Is that why her name is embedded in her... I, I, don't, I don't know, because th- this is the name... This is her, like, official birth name, but... They always called her Mademoiselle Rockcourt, and it's M L L E Rockcourt, and right. everything in the drawings and the ads that I found. Right. She was an actress, and she captivated. You know, Marie Antoinette was a big fan, and then you had Napoleon, right, a big fan, and she was scandalous. Like she was, and that that's why these people were fans because she was. Scandalous. She was talented on stage, but her life was surrounded by controversy. And she's kind of like a child actor a bit because she started acting really young. And part of um, part of what you see is the the progression of how the the lights kind of swallow her. Yeah, because <laughs> it is. She became so famous that everybody was after her. Right. She had, I mean, she had um, big influential people after her. So I think that. She might be an example of the first blow up of fame and how fame kind of swallowed her into right. a lot of scandal to the point where she kind of had to live, run away. And then, and, and they kind well, of, she was me. imprisoned, wasn't she? Well, yeah, <laughs> but it was just a lot of scandal. Like she was financed by this lady who was a lesbian and she was very prominent for doing those things independently wealthy and a lot of the time there was a debtor's prison and, and all of that but she she was part of uh the official theater right before Marie Antoinette's government and the, the revolution. revolution happened so yeah. so all of the actors in that in that theater had to go to jail for it, like six months or so yeah and it's called the the theater francaise that they, we actually went there. Did we actually see this? Well, I don't know that this is the theater inside of Versailles. Oh, okay. But they performed there as well. But the company okay. is like government stamped official. Right. Um, so that's why the actors in that company had to go to jail for six months after. Right. Um, the revolution happened, and I mean, I guess it's better than getting. But your- then they were brought back because I mean, yeah, everyone liked her. Yeah, so she she went to jail, and she met the love of her life there, and you. It was interesting to hear about her, and what's she, the love of her life's name? I. <laughs> I don't, um, Henriette Simonotte de Ponty. And so she met her and they were together until she died. And after she got out of jail, she was named the director of the Theater Louvois and Napoleon came and made her, um, she gave her a company and a pension. And then and she went on tour. She and... went to Milan and she was very well received because she has a French and Italian background. Right. So they just loved her and, um, so it was, she was a very big deal in the theater, even now, the Theater Francais. That's where I got some of the images. They have it's ads. really cool to be able to see, like, the, <laughs> the advertisements for her performances. It's so interesting. And it's so interesting that there was a portrait that was sent by a fan that the theater has. And you can see, I mean, it's like, talk about fan mail and it doesn't <laughs> even, you know. Yeah. It's just... It's so cool that, I mean, I know, like, there's a level of privilege to have that much history on you. 
from so long ago, but right. this is like the first superstar or one of the first like really fame and fame enveloped her and right. But you know, I mean, we would, you could go to a museum and pass by her painting, and it's like you see somebody else before it, you see somebody else after it, and you don't really know yeah. what it is that you're looking at. And I it's mean, had so much. There's so much appreciation for now. Who she like? One of the paintings on the wall would be her portrait, and it came from and like to know it's done by a fan. That'd be really interesting to find out. And yeah, how she and, lived her life. And and the fact that she was a queer woman. Yeah, I mean, she was... That lived her life open, well, as openly as she could without the scandal, which... Well, I mean, that's... Her. The scandal came from being so open about it. Yeah. So, I mean, she she is in Pierre Lachaise, buried there. I would want to go see her grave. Even that, the she they weren't going to let her into the church. I oh yeah, her funeral. There was like a riot, and they had to. They broke in. So the priest was not going to allow nope. her body to enter the church, and, and, and there were thousands of people who were outside the church demanding that she be um, allowed in for the funeral services, and they broke down the doors. Yeah, and King Louis the I don't know fourteenth or whatever. I don't really know how to read numerals. I forgot. I learned it when I was a child, and I forgot now. So but King Louis sent like, people to and saved the priest's neck basically yeah, because they were about to fucking rip him apart, <laughs> saying, you know, like no, she needs a funeral service, and, and the king is like, no, give her, give this actress her her proper service, and it's like fine. And she got it. So she got it. with this actress, we didn't have quotes because it's so long ago. She she was born in 1756. And I don't, I couldn't find quotes from her, but I found the things that people would say about her. So this one, um, this one lady wrote in her memoirs, uh, it's Virgie Lebrun. Mm-hmm. She said of her, after seeing her first performance as Dido, the beauty of her face, her figure, her voice, her declamation, everything foreshadowed a perfect actress. Uh, and I, I Did think, she paint the painting? No. Uh, probably not. No, but she talks about how pure she was and right. how everybody wanted her, a piece of her. And it's mm-hmm. kind of like, you know, you can see how later on it, it went downhill a bit because they kind of, they took a piece. You know, she was so, it was at the start. So, right. Anyways. <laughs> and then the, the last, uh, the last guy that we want to talk about is Mark Blitzstein. And he was a composer, best known for his uh, opera, The Cl- the Cradle Will Rock. Right. And Tim Robbins made a movie about this guy. Yes. And A Cradle Will Rock. About so, how that opera came Yeah, to be. so, I mean, his his life, he was, it's really interesting because you start to, to see other people, other composers come into the light. Right. Of, of the uh, others that we've seen. Um, when was Bernstein he born? Was one of them. So he was born in March 2nd, 1905. 1905, so the beginning of the 19th century. And... Bernstein became uh, one of his protégés. Yeah, and then he would later conduct some of his stuff. Yeah. So, in even... Um, Orwell? Orson Welles. Orson Welles did a production of, yeah. of this, uh, The Cradle Will Rock. And it was he very, did the very first production. Yeah, and, and it was very timely. It was about unions. And, but, you know, they they'd had a... a a beef with funding. And so they didn't have any money. They didn't even have, they didn't know what theater they were going to be perform- performing it in it until was, the night of it that was performance. So stripped down. And I think that added so much of a bigger punch. Right. That had even more of an effect because the show must go on and they, they got it done and they did it and it was to rave reviews and that, this shot him to I mean, fame. Orson Welles, can you imagine? If anybody's going to work <laughs> with no money and have a stripped down performance, you'd want Orson Welles to do it because he was so talented. Like, yeah, yeah. And I mean, this this guy, uh, Blitzstein, he was, he was publicly closeted, but he was honest about his homosexuality. 
to the people who knew him and even to his wife. Even to his wife. <laughs> and she knew and yeah. it was, uh, it's in her diaries. She's very, it was open. It was an open secret. And after his wife passed, I think they were And married. it wasn't just a, a marriage of convenience either. No. They actually did love each other. Yeah. And, and he, he was, was impacted. That's her. one of the reasons why he dove into a cradle wall rock. Yeah. Yeah. Because she died and he was, he was just stricken by it. Yeah. And it's, I, it's really interesting to, to just know about, I guess what, what inspired him about, I, I don't know. I don't know. I'm getting lost at what I'm trying to say, but. What are you, like, what are you thinking? No, I'm, cause I was thinking about how he wrote his music and how the island, the island that he would visit on holidays. Is right. it Mar- Martinique? Yeah, I he think would it was visit Martinique. there for holidays a lot. And I mean, it was famous for having like rent boys and sailors and, right. And all of that. And I mean, that's a, eventually how he died. They, they, they beat him up for propositioning three sailors, I think. And yeah. And he, he was found in the morning, bled. And he was right able out, to yeah. um, identify the same. And the Italian director, he had a really mysterious death too. Um, yeah, because they they accused him. I mean, you can see he's one of those people that are like, well, everybody and their mom wanted to kill you. Right. Because everybody was outraged by him and he was run over. What was the director's name again? Pierpaolo Pasolini. Pasolini. So he had a mysterious death. And then this... Composer. Yeah, and this composer was, I mean, he was really open to his sister. He came out to her. Right. And, I mean, some of some of his quotes, I think the, the, the last bit on the letter, he said, my sin is, has been the willingness to corrupt my nature. And... So he's basically saying to not be true to himself is where he went wrong. Yeah, and he's basically, and he does say that he he accepted who he is, right? And really knowing all that involves, so it's it's interesting if more people would do that, right? The art that they could create, and I know you know it was really hard to do it back then, and he wasn't like super open and public about it, and there there's even a point where. I'm his autobiographer and the research that I that I got the autobiographer he had a in his website in uh Mark Blitzstein's website there's accounts of the work the autobiographer did to prove like, he w- we're not just saying he was queer there's all this proof right and he had access by by Mark Blitzstein's sister while she was alive to journals and to everything and the family really wasn't opposed to all of it coming out. Right. So um, his sister died before the book was published. So he, the the autobiographer had freedom to kind of say what he was wanted to say and what he needed to say without the family opposing. But he, even then he said that he didn't think the family would have opposed any anything that he said because they they weren't that kind of family that was trying to hide some of these secrets. And it makes me think of Michelangelo and some of the research I did where right. his family took the poems that he did and changed the sexes. Right. And it was his cousin, right? Yeah. Michelangelo's cousin. Yeah. That and went so through and edited his, his poem. It's like, it just makes me think like how, how, what a shame that some of the work that people like him have put out kind of gets erased because of the shame people have. Right. About their family members. And I mean, he was a really achieved composer. And I mean, you, I'll, when I was going through the pictures, you see pictures of him composing and practicing with uh, the actors and, and all of it. And it was just like he had a full, a full life. And I'm glad that we got to, we get to. Right. Find I'm, out. 
I, that's one of my favorite parts about this is we have the information, but then there's a story there. There's like a life lived. But the really, yeah. And the really bad thing is that when I look at Britannica and some of these sources, they don't mention the queer parts. Right. But the queer parts are there and they're real. And I mean, I then they impact what the content is of what these people are doing. Yeah, I mean, and, and you get to if you see any meaning at all in what it is that they're creating, then you can't subtract out the that influence. I yeah, mean, and it has a meaning. It could have a meaning to so many people, so many queer people that are seeing the work. But if they knew a little bit more of the background, or they they could see like, oh, this is like a shout out to to me to feel that it's okay or to know that there's people out there that are like me that are accomplishing things. But right. back then there were examples, but nobody was allowed to find out about these examples. And, and so much of it was coded. I mean, we were, I was coded, reading about yeah. the choreography that was coded and it was a military musical, but um, in the to- stage production, they have these military guys come in and, and get fully dressed in their uniforms. They find out the mission is not on. So what do they have to do? They have to take <laughs> off their uniforms. And so they do a strip tease, <laughs> like right there on the stage. And gay people are going to see that and know exactly what it is that they're seeing. But straight, straight people at the time, it wasn't even on their radar what was going on. It was so coded. But like the queerness was written into... Like the idea of what was going to be happening on stage, it was choreographed into the performances and yeah. it was delivering on that level completely over the heads of the straight audiences who weren't tuning in on that frequency. And I mean, yeah, I mean, so it's there and f- to, to try to pretend that it's not, I mean, it's basically a joke because you're not going to understand what it is that they meant by what they were writing and choreographing and presenting. And people's lives, whoever you are and whatever kind of sexual orientation you are, they have an effect on your work. Some of the best work is by the most affected artists or in people out there, like some of the best work. And just it adds another shade to to the work it's not like you're you're the gay fill in the blank now no you're you're a painter you're a writer a composer who happens to be gay and i don't know like it's just yeah i'm enjoying finding out about all of these people to me it makes history relevant there's so much to know about history, but to know how it comes together around these people and what it is that they've done and brings it and makes it meaningful. It's not just this assortment of facts anymore. It coalesces around a person and a face and you can see it enacted in a photograph and described in words. And I love that it's making its way on Instagram and it's making its way into Image Amplified. So we wanted to talk about the last thing is the conferences that you're preparing for? Uh, yeah. Or potentially preparing for? Well, I did get some, I got some good news. Um, I got accepted into one of the, um, fashion critical studies panels. It was, it's for PhD students and, you know, people who've just recently earned their PhD. Um, it's going to be happening at Goldsmiths University in May. And really, it's about um, methodologies and innovative methodologies for conducting research. Um, the intimidating, but you know, exciting part I think about that it. you thrive in that kind of environment. I do like you're not the kind of you. I would be intimidated a lot more. So I think that it's just a it's fun to you. Well, one, it's like I've never done this before, so I'm really ignorant about probably what I should be afraid of and nervous about. But then, because I'm really interested in... But that's the benefit that you have, that you don't have to go in with these, like, I need to be this and I need to be that. You're just like, 
you know the research, you know what you I'm really been doing, into that, you like the research. It. I'm really into that. And, and I mean, if and I want the research that I do to be good, so yeah, like tear it apart and like tell me what needs to be better. But, but the you fact can hold that, your own. Well, okay, so chairing it, it we have. Dr. Joanne Entwistle, who I've referenced in my work. She's from King's College. Um, we have Professor Angela McRobbie. She's from Goldsmith, and I reference her in my work. And you have Professor Anya Rakamura. She's at LCF, London College of Fashion, and I reference her in my work. And you have Dr. Jane Tynan from CSM, and she's my supervisor. <laughs> so it's like... These are the people who've chaired, who are like That's responsible really for this panel. And yeah, I mean, I just found out today, um, Angela McRobbie wrote me 1030 last night. She works late. Um, tell, she told me that they accepted my submission. So I've got, I've got to start preparing for that. Um, I mean, when you've done some of similar things before, it's always been good. I like presenting. I, I like presenting. Um, I, I like being able to put together like a, a presentation around an idea and then around people who are, you know, for people who are interested in it and that will like give me questions and that kind of thing. Um, but then I'm also putting together an abstract for Fashion Tales 2020 and it's, you know, happening in July, I think it's July, no, June, um, in Milan, which we know right now. So is, maybe. Yeah, that's, it's very tenuous about whether or not it's going to happen. I mean. Because major events are not the coronavirus. going. Yeah, the coronavirus is kind of stopping some major events, major gatherings. In Italy, like Italy, Northern Italy. Especially, it's kind especially. of like a... But Fashion Tales has some really um interesting themes and i'm supposed to pick one of these themes and tailor an abstract around it that's what i'm working right now so let me just go over these themes one is like the first one is culture and commerce and that's how creativity and marketing art and trade come together for fashion and um and fashion is able to innovate and anticipate scenarios habits doings and visions right so you can see how that ties in with my research. The second one is sustainability versus capitalism. Um, the third one, exclusion versus, versus inclusion. And that's the unbalance between the promotion of restrictive visual standards and the aspiration to inclusive forms of representation. So wow. restriction versus inclusive. The fourth is, um, Political dressing, and that's dressing um, for political purposes through art, photography, cinema, social media, that kind of thing. The fifth is geopolitics of fashion. But number six, I think, is also really interesting, um, the politics of authenticity. So you have, like, authenticity and self-construction and how it's related to the professional practices of bands and gatekeepers, such as digital influencers. So that's related to what I'm doing. Um, you have labor and gender, privacy and data security, fashion and costume, fashion and architecture, fashion in the city, and fashion in the media. So like that fashion in the media is also really relevant. That's a big theme of mine. Um, the relations between fashion and media through celebrity culture and new forms of audiovisual narrations and film culture. So my work touches on at least three or four of those. So that's so loaded. <laughs> yeah. There are a lot of themes and but three or four of them really stand out. So right now in the middle of I I haven't really written many of these abstracts. I've never written an abstract for a conference specifically before. So I'm going to send it off to Jane and to um Nathaniel, who's supervising me on the ethnography side of my research. Um He's had a lot of experience as a PhD student. He had a lot of experience with yeah. conferences. And so I don't know. I would like to start doing them more often, but we've got to get over this little Corona hurdle first. Yeah. I really don't know how it's going to play <laughs> out. <laughs> like, honestly, I don't know. So much of it is just slow responses and we're kind of just 
getting some of the basics. Washing our hands, watching where we go. I, I think that has played into not going to the movies as much. Yeah, that was also bad as well. But, and, you know, getting our hands on some hand sanitizer. Um, some stockpiles. Not well, that we are. Much. <laughs> well, I have read that you have, that it's a good idea to have two weeks of food and water and medicine, whether it's your usual prescriptions or things that will help you with fevers and aches and pains for two weeks. Have a two week supply just in case you come in contact with someone who has the coronavirus and you have to be quarantined. You need to have some food and water and medicine accessible to you because you can't just run to the store and pick it up, or at least you shouldn't be. So that's why... I don't know. We'll we'll see what happens, but it seems to be coming out in bursts. Like, as the more testing they do, the more they find more cases. And while it's more dangerous for older people, it's still... I mean, you're not going to want to be reckless just because you might be young and... It damages it damages your immune system like from the moment you get it until like well after. I mean, you are forever impacted yeah, by having. Forever, yeah, forever as far too. as they know. I it's mean, scary. Yeah, so it's we scary. <laughs> we're getting to be about an hour now. Yeah, so we need to wrap this up. But be careful, guys, because <laughs> yeah, stay safe. Keep your hands Wash washed. Your hands. Don't go crazy and hoarding anything, but just be aware that it's good to have some things on hand. Prepare the bunker. And if you can't get your hands on sanitizer, learn how to make it. It's alcohol and aloe vera <laughs> gel. Just go buy some sanitizer. We're, if you can. We're on our way to the moon by planet. Pull okay. The stream from up there. Yeah, our next episode will be from the moon. All right. Okay. Bye. Bye. Thank you for listening. We hope you enjoyed it. Make sure you subscribe to our podcast, we put it out weekly, and follow us on social media, we're on every platform, Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, we're 